and welcome to my presentation about Karen Ornay. My name is Annika Sonneville, and uh, down in the corner, that's uh, that's my little mascot. You can you can look at that and pretend that's me because uh, my webcam is not working. So the biography of Karen Ornay, she was born in 1895 and she unfortunately passed away in 1952. Her early life was marked by feelings of envy and insecurity because of, of being the middle-born child of a strict German family. And she felt that she was being treated unequally as her father was forcing her to take care of her older brother almost like a wife would. This actually developed into an incestuous crush on him and triggered one of her major depressive uh, episodes early in her life because she, would, she tried to admit to her brother of her feelings and he pushed her away and she didn't know how to react. Um, and she was very much subject to her father being strict and uncaring and he would often force strict regimens of house cleaning and things like that on her while her brother basically did nothing and she waited him on waited on him hand and foot her education uh in early parts of her life she realized that she suffered from depression um and she attended the university of freeburg medical and then immediately after the University of God Göttingen and then the University of Berlin and at Berlin she decided to study psychoanalysis and graduated in 1915 this is also where she met her husband and their marriage was not the best she was very depressed and working and her brother had suffered an infection and uh, it ended in a divorce, and upon the divorce, she moved to the U.S. in 1932. She became the associate director of the Chicago Institute for Psychoanalysis, and eventually moved to Brooklyn and taught in the New York Psych Psychoanalysis Institute, and was expelled for her theories being different from Freud's. He was the main perspective on psychoanalysis at the time, and dis disagreeing with him was a big no-no. She founded the American Institute for Psychoanalysis, and she started the American Journal of Psychoanalysis later in her life, and she actually served as the dean at the American Institute for Psychoanalysis until her death in 1952. And her theory mainly centers around personality and neurosis, she feels that uh, personality develops early and that children have very basic needs such as food, affection, and safety, and when those needs are undermined by the parent or by the environment, um, anxiety can develop or neurosis can develop, or both, because they're both. And a neurotic need is a need that is irrational and it's a defense mechanism that manifests way itself in by way of personality traits, motivation, and actions, and it's determined uh, It's determined by the needs that were not met or were undermined in your youth. For example, if your mother didn't show you enough affection later in life, you might be really clingy and need affection from your partner or your friends or what have you. The compliant personality moves towards people and usually needs affection, approval, a dominant partner, somebody who can basically be a new parent for them. Whereas the aggressive personality is the exact opposite and moves against people. They need power and to exploit and prestige and admiration, achievement. Basically somebody who's a little power hungry and needs to feel like they're in control of their life while the detached personality moves away from others. They need self-sufficiency and perfection and narrow limits to life. Somebody who's a real neat freak, maybe. Somebody who really needs to control the situation. Not in a way that they, move, they put their control onto people, but in a way that they can feel like they have agency of themselves. 
uh, neurosis. Conflicting neurotic trends. So if you're trying to elicit two personality types at the same time, they fight, and that's the main reason for neurosis. One type seeks dominance over the other to be expressed. If, and my example is uh, an aggressive personality type person might also have the desire to be coddled like the compliant type. But because the aggressive personality is the dominant part, perhaps they push people away when they're affectionate towards them, even though they really want it. And anxiety, her definition for anxiety is feelings of helplessness and isolation. And this is also a root of neurosis. Now, Orne, Orne really, really disliked the sexual connotations and roots of Freud's theories, as you can see by this Venn diagram. They do share some idea ideologies such as the ego and superego and the importance of the unconscious, but Orne feels that a lot of our childhood tensions are a lot more crucial than Freud does and Freud thinks that it's all about sex because he's Freud and that's just how he functions. She's also really not a fan of his <laughs> uh, concept of penis envy and has actually offered up her own alternative of womb envy but we'll get to that in a minute right now. She heavily critiqued Freud's views of women and sex, and uh, a lot of his views had to do with how women were inferior and how they could become on par with men, whereas Ornai believes that women are on par with men already because we're people. Um, and that's just how human beings work. She feels that perhaps instead of just penis envy, maybe men also experience womb envy in that they cannot produce life like women can. She felt that women should develop themselves through careers, and this has to do with a lot of her like idealized self-image idea, where perhaps part of your idealized self-image is a career, and what that career is, and what that means for you. Um, she was very revolutionary for her time and challenged gender roles, and she, she often would question a lot of things in her upbringing and in her schooling, just why, why do the men get to do this thing and why do the women have to do that thing as a child and then just, well, why does it have to all be about sex, hmm? And then her idealized self-image she felt that everyone has an idealized self-image, whether it's healthy or not. The healthy kind would be something that's reasonable and realistic and flexible. And something that you can actually live up to. Whereas a neurotic idealized self-image would be falling to the tyranny of the shoulds. So I should be getting married because I'm this age. I should be having a job because I'm at this part of my life. I should be doing this. I should be doing that. It's also unrealistic and overly critical of oneself. So perhaps you really, really feel like you should be having your PhD by now, but you're 22. You're fine. You don't need to get a PhD at 22. It'd be really nice, but it's not necessarily realistic for your situation. Now you'll notice that she doesn't talk about religion much. I, I kind of think that might, that might have to do with her upbringing. I have, I have searched far and wide to try and find any opinion that Orn I might have had on religion, and all I could find was that she was raised Christian, and she did not have a very positive view on marriage and religion because she viewed them as, like, a compulsory part of our culture that she didn't agree with. Her father was very strict and religious, and uh, would often force her and her brother to memorize Bible verses and if they got one word wrong in the verse, he would hit them on the head with the Bible. So this is where we get on to my case study, Jane Doe, which is a alias for a good friend of mine. Jane Doe is 22 years old. I met her in my freshman year of community college, and she just recently moved out of her parents' house because they had been keeping her under 
their thumb for a very long time. When she did leave in the house, it was a hectic and unstable environment. Often, she wouldn't know what she was coming home to, whether her stepmother was going to be upset with her, or if her stepmother was going to be very warm and caring towards her. She wasn't sure if her father was going to be home, and if he would agree with the stepmother and go along with either berating her or supporting her. Uh, they would often make promises or offer to help her in some way to gain her own agency and sustainability and then either break those promises or come up with a reason why they cannot provide those services because of a shortcoming of hers. Usually it was something arbitrary like you haven't done your chores. It was very silly. Um, they made, they made Jen, Jane very dependent on them for support. She has a lot of health problems, mostly with her scoliosis and her uh, orthodontia is very complex. But uh, they would often hold that over her head of just, we pay your health insurance, so you need to do what we say. And uh, would often manipulate her. And they actually ran a company that did set up for weddings and events and parties and would use her as free labor. In, in return for living at the house rent-free, even though they didn't make that a po policy for her living there. Today, she's been struggling with OCD, trichotillomania, ADD, and generalized anxiety disorder, and semi-regularly sees a therapist. Granted, it's provided through her community college, so she only gets so many sessions, but she is seeking help, so that's good. Jane resembles the compliant personality and the detached personality. This is the main source of her neurosis. At least that's what Karen would say. Compliant personalities is the dominant one, but the detached one yearns for self-sufficiency. Jane really, really wants to be de independent and be an adult and grow up like everybody else, but she's also really struggling with how, mu how scared she is to be independent and how scared she is to go against her parents. And I say go against her parents with like air quotes around it because a lot of that has to do with anything they don't like. Anything from cutting her hair to not seeing them on the holidays. Really, really little stuff like that. Not even something so much as actually standing up to them and saying, you made me feel like this, and I'm confronting you about it. Nothing like that. Little things. Jane exhibits these personality types by being very clingy and physical, both with her friends and with her uh, romantic partner. We'll call him James. Um, and she celebrates every little tiny victory of personal growth, and then sort of remains satisfied with that. So, she got her own f cell phone recently. Okay. And she was very proud of herself because she's paying for it and she's not relying on her parents anymore for that particular expense. So she kind of just was complacent with that and fine with that, even though they were still yanking on her chain all the time. She has a really unclear idea of what she wants for herself. That is one of the biggest problems that Jane faces. Um, you can't even ask this girl, where do you want to go to eat, without her saying, I don't know, whatever you want. She's very, she very much defers all choice making to the other parties in the room, unless she is completely alone. Karen would tell her, that gaining a clearer understanding of what she wants for her life and her idealized self would definitely be a good start. Setting goals for the long term, maybe even assessing what her career goal would be and if that is the right choice for her. She would also help her assess if her idealized self image was healthy uh, and being aware of what unconscious needs are the, th the needs that are ruling her. 
because a lot of it has to do with affection and trust and stability, but it also has to do with being self-sufficient. And uh, allowing herself to be independent, not only from her parents, but her, from her friends and other relationships. Because as much as me and my friends love hanging out with Jane, it gets a little tiring when you need to make a decision, such as where we're going to eat. So why did I pick Karen? I picked Karen because <laughs> I used the quote, the enemy of my, the enemy is my friend. Um, I, re I also really don't like Freud and a lot of his theories. I think they're tired. I think they're old. And I hear about them every psych class I take. It doesn't matter what the subject is. She was also the one theorist I knew the least about because of the theorists in this class that I have studied in previous classes. Um, Karen usually got swept under the rug with just her womb envy and her f uh, feminine psychology parts, never really going in depth about her. She was also the only female theorist. I know that's a weird bias, but come on. Her ideas also line up with Maslow in some ways, at least with the idealized self or self-actualization part. And I really, really enjoy that model for self-help and for uh, even cognitive therapy. She also doesn't make her development of personality stage-based. That's what I like. It's, it's very flexible, and it uh, leaves a lot of room for growth. Unlike, say, Freud, where it's, you have to meet these stages in order for you to be a developed person. She's also more recent. She died in the 50s, which, that's not very long ago at all. And she suffered from mental illness, which I know a lot of theorists did, but there's something kind of personal about being able to say, hey, you, these, ther these theorists all suffered, but this particular one suffers from something I can relate to. So in conclusion, a lot of the self-help therapy that we see in today's world with the books and the tapes and the yoga uh, borrows from Ornai's perspectives and thoughts about life, but they sometimes they put like a spiritualistic spin on it. For example, uh, if you go to any any like reader of cards or runes or palms or whatever, a lot of a lot of what they have to give you as far as advice usually has to do with well, where do you see yourself in so many years and how do you see your ideal self? And then based on your answers can determine what they need to tell you. Not to mention the feminists absolutely adore her and have expounded on her theories by themselves, both for the better and the worse. And uh, in particular, her theory could easily be applied to uh, early screening for foster youth in the foster care system, which I am one of. <laughs> this is a very personal project, I guess you could say, for me. Um, a lot of foster youth have very identifiable characteristics that could easily be articulated via her theory to uh, better their experience both in the system and in their foster placement. So letting, letting the foster parent know where these kids have been classified will also let this parent know what needs need to be satisfied and what needs need to be monitored. So if a kid comes into the system and is clearly more dependent and uh, clingy, then clearly that child never really got a lot of affection. So that would be something for the, the foster parent to be aware of. Not necessarily to say that the foster parent needs to love on that kid a bunch, but just something to keep in mind. And these are all the works that I cited. Give you a good look at those. One of them's a lecture. 